OBM and the Holocaust. This uh, I've just finished reading it. It's taken me far too long. I've been dragging my feet. I've been putting it off and I haven't been um, honoring the commitment that I made to read this book. But I finally got to the end and I have uh, made massive amounts of notes, highlighted it. I managed to use the same color all the way through. So all my highlights in this are blue. I used a bit of pencil and I used these blue tabs here to mark up some interesting uh, quotes and stories and anecdotes. So um, what I'm going to do next is uh, walk you through IBM and the Holocaust by Edwin Black. It's a fascinating book. It is a very prescient and uh, a useful warning to heed for the times that we live in nowadays. Um, the events of this took place less than a hundred years ago. And um, yeah, without further ado, let's get right into it. So the first thing I want to talk about is uh, the, the presentation. I picked up this book uh, secondhand. It was twelve ninety nine when it was first released in 2001. That was the RRP. Uh, I got it and it was still six ninety nine, which is kind of pricey. Still on the high side for a secondhand book in a charity shop. Uh, I don't know if you can see that there. But it's it's great. I, I, I grabbed it as soon as I had it because somebody, a friend of mine, had told me about IBM's involvement in the Holocaust. And I was uh, incredulous and I'd never heard about it before. So as soon as I saw this book, I knew I had to get it and read it to find out if what my friend had told me about IBM was true. And so when you uh, get this book, the first thing you notice is this very uh, eye-catching cover, which is styled after the punch cards used in the Hollerith machines, which IBM uh, built and, and loaned out to uh, the Nazis. Um, and you can see, if I open it up here, that this front page actually has holes punched in it, which I think is a really nice touch. Um, and just kind of, but it makes the book a little bit creepy, I've got to say. Um, but certainly it stands out. Um, and then when you get inside, that's a picture of uh, the punch cards, which these machines used. And then another page worth showing is this. And this picture um, is pretty fascinating. It's got a huge eye at the top, which is looking down over a city. And uh, the city is in silhouette against one of the uh, punch cards. Um, and then translated, it says, see everything with Hollerith punch cards. The eye, the all seeing eye, that appears all over the place, particularly, uh, most notably, it's on uh, American currency. I think the $1 bill, it's at the top of uh, the capstone on, a, on the pyramid that's on that piece of currency. But, um, you know, the eye kind of represents surveillance as well as many other things. And uh, it reminded me of Big Brother. And then I was thinking this poster was made before Big Brother was written because this was made in 1934. And if I'm not mistaken, 1984 was written in 1948. But of course, that's the book that has a uh, big brother in it. Um, the book sets us up nicely before we've even started reading it with this, uh, with this cover, with the pictures, it's already kind of letting us know where it's going to go. And then the dedication on the inside is to my daughter, Rachel, who will read this book and to 6 million who will not. So, um, it's pretty powerful stuff right off the bat. So I'm going to start with the uh, chapter two, which is the IBM Hitler intersection. Um, this is a chapter which draws parallels between uh, the chairman of IBM, which is a gentleman called Thomas J. Watson uh, and Hitler. Um, and the parallels drawn uh, between the way Thomas Watson runs uh, IBM and the way Hitler uh, gets the power. So it tells us at the beginning that uh, on January the 30th, 1933, the world awoke to a frightening new reality. Adolf Hitler had suddenly become leader of Germany. Now, I don't know how suddenly that happened. Um, if, it, if he just kind of came out of obscurity from nowhere to take over, I'm not so up on my World War II history. Um, but then we start to get these parallels between Thomas J. Watson and Hitler. Um, we, we get the background of Thomas Watson and, and basically he's a very unscrupulous salesman. He is uh, selling, I believe, cash registers in America. 
and he's going around and he's lying to customers and he's putting his rivals out of business and he's getting involved in all sorts of underhand, shady, dodgy dealings and tactics in order to make the sale. So he's just basically an unethical salesman who will do anything to get that, um, get that dollar. So um, that's, that's kind of the angle that he comes in at and he rises very quickly in the businesses that he works for because, um, because he's a cutthroat bastard basically. Um, so that's, that's his background. So we've got these two gentlemen, they are on different places, different backgrounds, but they are kind of rising up and seizing power through any means uh, that they can get it. IBM uses this Hollerith technology and Hollerith is the name of the inventor. And this technology, they're, they're machines for tabulating data and they're initially used for um, to take census or sensei, I'm not sure what the plural is of that word, but originally um, they used to uh, gather data and, and carry out a census of a, of a given population. Um, so we, we learned that Hollerith's first major overseas census was organized for the brutal regime of Tsar Nicholas II to launch the first ever census of an estimated 120 million Russians. At this point, it isn't IBM. This is just Hollerith and his tabulating machines, but they eventually become IBM. Hollerith starts doing census for governments and uh, because he's, his machines are the only machines capable of doing this uh he basically just um puts the price up to whatever he wants uh, and so we got um we get told uh, quote director of the census bureau simeon north uncovered numerous irregularities in the bureau's contracts for punch card machines hollerith was gouging the federal government uh, so, so the origins of this company, IBM and the machines they're using, uh, it comes from a place of gouging the governments, um, but they're positioning themselves as kind of a, a monopoly. They're the only uh, machines that can do what, uh, what is needed. Um, and they know that governments and they always want more data. They always want more information. Um, they really want to, I mean, the, the idea of having a census done goes all the way back to biblical times. Um, and it tends to precede what, what usually follows after a census is carried out. Um, I'll let you cast your mind back to examples of, uh, census, the censuses, censuses that have been done throughout history, uh, and, uh, and answer that question for yourself. All right. So I just checked quickly and it looks like we can say census or censuses for the plural. I think I'm going to go with censuses. It works better and it won't confuse people who think that I just don't know how to use the plural version of census. Um, so we have Hollerith. He's uh, carrying out censuses for people with his machines. Um, and then he sells out and a gentleman called Charles Flint comes in, uh, a rugged individualist who at the edge of the 19th century epitomized the affluent adventurer capitalist. Flint's war profiteering knew no limits. Flint would happily sell guns and naval vessels to both sides of a brutal war. So Hollerith is uh, selling out to this gentleman called Flint, and Flint is a pretty unethical um, bastard as well. So this is one of the key things to bear in mind is that um, some whenever these wars break out, the money to fund them has to come from somewhere, and the weapons to fight them have to come from somewhere. And getting to the bottom of where this money comes from and where these weapons and come from uh, is, is pretty enlightening. It's pretty amazing to see how often this happens, that two sides of a war are bankrolled by the same people, um, follow the money, as they say. So eventually, uh, this gentleman, Charles Flint, he teams up with Thomas J. Watson. They kind of become a, a match made in hell. They're both unscrupulous and they are both focused on getting that sale and making that money no matter the cost uh, so once hollerith is bought it then is uh, re rebranded into ibm which stands for international business machines and uh, this chapter goes on to talk about how watson when he becomes the chairman of ibm starts to run it kind of like a cult quote we always refer to our people as the ibm family watson emphasized to his employees and we mean the wives and children as well as the men. He continually spoke in terms of oneness with IBM. So this is the idea of the corporate family. And uh, a lot of companies I've worked for take this line of we're a family, we're one big family, and 
we need to act like a family and behave like a family and do what's best for the family. And, and of course, it's not true. You're a corporation. It's an employer. It's a very inaccurate to, to say the people you work with are your family. Although business owners and the, the power elite of the world would like you to replace your family with your colleagues and your, your corporation and, and your employer, I'm sure they would like that very much. Interestingly, uh, quote, Watson's own son, Tom, who inherited his father's throne at IBM, admitted, the more I worked at IBM, the more I resented dad for the cult-like atmosphere that surrounded him. So not only is IBM your family, uh, Watson is your dad. He's your daddy and he's going to look after you and take care of you and pay you and uh, make everything all right. Um, so another quote, the ever-present equating of his name with the word think was more than an Orwellian exercise. It was a true life indoctrination, end quote. So Watson decides to uh, kind of plaster the word think all over his offices and on the stairs and things like that and kind of this becomes the uh, the mantra of the company at this point in history uh, and they do lots of slogans um, slogans were endlessly drilled into the extended IBM family we forgive thoughtful mistakes there is no such thing as standing still pack up your troubles Mr. Watson is here they even have songs Quote, they began the very first day a man entered the IBM culture, the songs. They never ended during one's entire tenure. More than 100 songs were sung at various company functions. There were several for Watson, including the IBM anthem. And uh, I'm going to recite that for you right now. And forgive me, I don't know the tune, so I can't sing it for you. But the words go, there's a thrill in store for all, for we're about to toast the corporation that we represent. We're here to cheer each pioneer and also proudly boast of that man of men, our sterling president. The name of T.J. Watson means a courage none can stem, and we feel honored to be here to toast the IBM. Books and turn to page five. Page five in the songbook will do one verse and two choruses of Ever Onward on page five of the songbook. <laughs> The corporation that we represent. We're here to cheer each pioneer and also proudly boast of that man of men, our friend and guiding hand. The name of T.J. Watson means the courage not condemned, and we feel honored to be here to help the effort. I feel like pretty, I don't know, proud. There's something powerful about this kind of uh, song and the rhymes and the, the, the lilt of the words and stuff. I can imagine either getting caught up in this when working for IBM or finding the whole thing very creepy and weird and uh, quickly looking for a job somewhere else. So next, uh, Hitler suddenly rises to power. Um, and uh, where we learn that, quote, the question confronting all businessmen in 1933 was whether trading with Germany was worth either the economic risk or moral dissent, end quote. And this becomes a real concern because of the ramping up of Hitler, his popularity, his, his uh, ascension, the energy that he's putting off the things he's saying and um, the fact that there is at this point international trade going on businesses are starting to wonder hmm, can we keep uh, keep our operations going we, we learned that uh, 
When Hitler rose to power, a German intellect descended into madness. Quote, Guiding the brown shirts and exhorting the masses was an elite coterie of pseudoscientists, corrupted professionals, and profit-blinded industrialists. Um, end quote. So these are the kind of people that are surrounding Hitler. Um, and what happens is when Hitler kind of gets some power, all the scientists and um various academics start trying to uh they're, they're sort of tripping over to come up with theories and proof and evidence of of his thoughts and the way he thinks and the things he wants to do right and so he ends up being surrounded by scientists and uh, philosophers and academics but interestingly and importantly statisticians what are these people gonna love more than anything well they're gonna love a machine that can collect and gather data and tabulate it very quickly and rapidly um, because you got to remember at this time in history computers didn't exist yet in the way they do now and, and it's pretty staggering to think of the, the the distance we've come in terms of computing power but back at this time they didn't really have anything apart from pen and paper this was the advent of that big data collection and uh, processing um, and of course hitler and the nazis they are starting to think well we are going to have to um, find a way to keep tabs on everyone. So guess what we're going to have to do? We're going to have to do a census. So you can kind of see where this is going. So the end of this chapter, we have a good quote here, which was, um, quote, because of the almost limitless need for tabulators in Hitler's race and geopolitical wars, IBM NY reacted enthusiastically to the prospects of Nazism. While other fearful or reviled American businessmen were curtailing or cancelling their dealings with Germany, Watson embarked upon an historic expansion of Dehomag. Dehomag is the um, German uh, company that they sort of incorporate, but they, they, they leave it called Dehomag, even though it's controlled by IBM and functions as a subsidiary of IBM New York. Quote, just weeks after Hitler came to power, IBM NY invested more than 7 million Reichsmarks in excess of a million dollars to dramatically expand the German subsidiary's ability to manufacture machines. So you can imagine Watson, he's got dollar signs in his eyes when he learns of uh, Hitler and what he's all about. Um, and so then the story moves from how Watson sort of positions himself and maneuvers himself to to become influential in germany in order to keep supplying them with these uh holorith machines they're really uh ubiquitous machines that can be used in all aspects of running uh, any sort of operation like an economy or uh, a war machine so then we move on to the next chapter which is chapter three identifying the jews I can't believe i'm only on chapter three i'm gonna have to get through this a bit quicker um, but here, this is where we learn um, of IBM's continued expansion. But they also get prosecuted by the U.S. Justice Department, uh, the Antitrust Division, for secretive acts of monopoly. So IBM's on the radar, and Watson himself has already had criminal charges brought against him. Um, and in Chapter 3, we start learning about how he uh, donates to Roosevelt and becomes Roosevelt's advisor. Uh, and at the same time, he, Watson is also whining and dining Nazi uh, VIPs. And he's carrying around letters from the president in his pockets and he's kind of showing them off to people and um, making himself seem very influential and uh, just living this life of uh, influence, even though he is unelected. Nobody wants to have him whispering things into the ear of the president. Nobody, uh, none of the populations in these countries want to have him going back and forth between powerful individuals, but he manages to get into that position anyway. Um, so it's pretty interesting how he can do that because he is a chairman of a huge company. He's making a lot of money. And just the fact that you make money and you own a big business or you run a big business seems to be enough to get you an audience with uh, powerful and influential and important people. Um, so they're, they're helping Nazi Germany carry out a census. Uh, and then we learn, uh, quote, clearly there was a lucrative future for IBM in Nazi Germany. At a time when other foreign companies were fleeing the Reich's violence, repression, anti-Semitism, and the inability to retrieve income from German operations, 
Watson moved swiftly to dramatically enlarge IBM's presence. Through a cunning twirl of losses and profits among the four German companies and then manipulating balances owed by those subsidiaries to IBM NY for so-called loans, Reich profit taxes would be avoided despite record earnings in Germany. So this is like when we, we start learning about all these um, kind of corporate structures and, and methods for uh, moving around and protecting income and profits. Uh, so we learn, quote, IBM increased its investment in Dehelmag from a mere 400,000 Reichsmarks to more than 7 million, which is about a million Depression era American dollars. Um, so they're, they're ramping up their investment in uh, Dehelmag. They are ex anticipating to be providing more machines and um, getting their 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 machines and technology m more entrenched in the Nazi war machine uh, and the, the the Nazi government in Germany. They are really unabashed and unashamed about this. And um, it says here, quote, despite a highly publicized boycott against German ocean liners, Watson ignored picket lines and sailed on the German ship Bremen. So Watson's going backwards and forwards. He's ignoring the pro ignoring the protests. He's ignoring the uh, the boycotts and the calls to uh, to not help Germany and Hitler. Um, he doesn't care. He's just doing it anyway. So we find out that um, nobody figures out that IBM is so involved in um, Hitler's war machine. And this is the part of the story that really blows my mind. Nobody figured it out. Nobody moved to shut down IBM and stop what they were doing. But um, part of the explanation for this could be, quote, for one, IBM's economic entanglements with Nazi Germany remained beneath public perception. Few understood the far-reaching ramifications of punch card technology, and even fewer had a foreground understanding that the company Dehomag was in fact essentially a wholly owned subsidiary of international business machines. Quote, IBM and Watson were not identified. Anti-Nazi agitators just didn't understand the dynamics of corporate multinationalism. Moreover, IBM was not importing German merchandise, it was exporting machinery. Watson admired the whole concept of fascism. Fascism was good for business, end quote. So the page is kind of telling us about how um, they are, they're sort of going, well, we're not, we're not buying any German goods, you know, we're just, we're just supplying them with machines. Um, exporting machinery and um it's this idea of corporate multinationalism that i mentioned at the beginning that this book is kind of a, a very useful warning for today's day and age because now we live in in an age where multinational international corporations they make more money uh, than countries do and these things are huge and um they have they have grown bigger than countries and nations and so what do we do with organizations and and, and structures that are this big um and where do we how do we how do we rein them in and how do we prevent them from uh, going too far and going over the top and so you can see here that ibm had this uh position which allowed it to continue operating even though it was uh really involved in a lot of murder and atrocities um, so there's another good quote down here, which I quite liked, uh, quote, Thomas Watson and IBM had separately and jointly spent decades making money any way they could. Rules were broken. Conspiracies were hatched. Bloody wars became mere market opportunities. To a supranational, making money is equal parts commercial Darwinism, corporate ecclesiastics, dynastic chauvinism, and solipsistic greed. Uh, just a wonderful sentence to sum up the risk uh, of having these huge corporations uh, in existence and what they are truly about because these things get so big that they are carried forward by their own momentum and no one person has the power at a certain after a certain point to put the brakes on and they um, serve themselves so it's amazing that this was happening at this time and it may have been a IBM may have been a precursor to uh, to kind of what we're seeing happen nowadays. So then we start here learning about Watson, uh, how he positions himself as a philanthropic benefactor to humanity, 
who um, does all sorts of wonderful things. Um, so Watson uses charitable donations to telescope his own importance. The roll call of honorary appointments of power and prestige was long and enviable. He was the chairman of the Carnegie Endowment for Peace, trustee of New York University, and chairman of the American section of the International Chamber of Commerce. Um, American newspapers prominently reported that Watson had been both nominated unopposed as a director of the Federal Reserve Bank and appointed trustee of Columbia University. While the Hoover Justice Department was at the height of its antitrust investigation of IBM in 1932, Watson donated large sums to the Roosevelt campaign. Roosevelt's election over Hoover was a landslide. Watson now had entree to the White House itself. Watson carefully curried favor with Roosevelt by publicly supporting some of his most controversial policies. Soon, Watson was sending policy suggestions to the president. The two men began to correspond regularly. Soon, Roosevelt came to rely on Watson for advice. So I realized I just basically read that whole page, but it's uh, just a, a great summary of how people who are unelected get into positions of power and start to influence the way things are run and what's going on and what happens so that people, the average Joe and Jane on the street, they, they get, their lives get affected by it. And uh, this person was never elected, but he managed to maneuver himself to that position uh, and uh, as we find out this is someone who's extremely sympathetic to Hitler and um, Nazism and uh, has a has a quote personal attraction to the dictator's style even observing similarities with his own corporate capitalistic model so this is a uh, Watson talking about Hitler one thing which has greatly impressed me in connection with Hitler's leadership conceded Watson is the loyalty displayed by the people. To have the loyalty and cooperation of everyone means progress and ultimate success for a nation or an individual business. We should pay tribute to Mussolini for establishing this spirit of loyal support and cooperation. My bad, he was talking about Mussolini, but still you get the idea. Mussolini's um, definition, I believe, of fascism was when there's no distinction between government and um, and, and corporations and business, something like that. And and so you're kind of learning about how that system works and how it is still in existence today. I mean, can you think of anyone who has massive amounts of power and influence who was not elected uh, and is just basically a business owner? I can think of a few off the top of my head. Um, and that brings us to the end of chapter three. So now uh, we're on chapter four, which is the IBM Nazi Alliance this chapter covers the fact that these Hollerith machines, which which IBM are loaning out all over the place to uh, people such as Hitler and his regime, they need these punch cards to run. And guess who is the only company that makes these punch cards? You got it. It's IBM. Once Hitler took over, there, there starts to be this problem of, oh, can we be seen to have subsidiaries in Nazi Germany and be making profits over there. And so uh, the way this is handled is uh, pretty interesting. Quote, to achieve his goals, each man had to cooperate in an international campaign of corporate schizophrenia designed to achieve maximum deniability for both Dehomag and IBM. The storyline depended upon the circumstance and the listener. Dehomag could be portrayed as the American-controlled, almost wholly owned subsidiary of IBM, with token German shareholders and on-site German managers. Or, Dehomag could be a loyal German, staunchly Aryan company, baptized in the blood of Nazi ideology, wielding the power of its American investment for the greater glory of Hitler's Reich. Indeed, Heidinger and Watson both were willing to wave either banner as needed. Both stories were true. Watson had seen to that. So both stories were true is also reminiscent of 1984 and Orwell's concept of double think. And uh, you, you realize now that the, the nations are not the important things. The political movements, the loyalties to the nations, the flags, these are not the important thing. The important thing is IBM as a business and whatever label they need, whatever position they need to assume in order to keep that profit going, 
in order to keep their monopoly building out, to keep expanding, to keep growing. Uh, they don't care. They'll use it. They'll do it. And I think this is um, a key part of what I alluded to earlier, which is like when you start reading history and you learn that the money and the weapons come from somewhere and often some they come from the same place for both sides of a, of a conflict, you, you kind of realize that um, this is how it's done. There are organizations which do not care for national borders and boundaries. And then that's certainly a theme that runs through this book. Um, okay, so next uh, we've got a note that I made in the margin here, which is connection between automation, technocracy, and tyranny. So the quote is, so basically we've got Hitler is um, using the Hollerith machines provided by IBM to carry out censuses in order to find out where the Jews are and who is a Jew to do what he likes to do with Jews. This part shows us that data collection is absolutely critical because this book is attempting to answer how did Hitler get the names? How did he know who to target and where they lived and how to round them up and cart them off so efficiently. This is apparently, until the publication of this book, always been a mystery and no one had ever figured it out before. Um, so, quote, while Hitler's rhetoric was burning the parade grounds and airwaves, while stormtroopers were marching Jews through the streets in ritual humiliations, while Reich legislative decrees and a miasma of regional and private policies were ousting Jews from their professions and residences, while noisy, outrageous acts of persecution were appalling the world, a quieter process was also underway. Germany was automating. But now Hitler's Reich discovered that in its quest for supremacy, it could mechanize, organize, and control virtually all aspects of private and commercial life, from the largest industrial cartel to the humblest local shopkeeper. So I wrote this down as technocracy and tyranny because uh, you must think about what Hitler managed to do with this kind of, uh, well, I mean, nowadays, primitive technology, you got to put pieces of cardboard in it and it punches holes in them. Imagine what he managed to do with that technology versus what could be done with the technology that exists now. You know, we're all carrying around data collection devices. We are being recorded 24-7. We are being filmed 24-7. We all better pray that another Hitler does not suddenly come to power and decide to use all that technology on a specific group or subsection of our populations. Um, that was a pretty scary thought when I was seeing how this one piece of technology and the data gathering, what it led to the, the, the suffering and the millions of deaths, right? Um, pretty scary considering how far we've come since then. And so I'm just going to whiz through a few quotes from this chapter because uh, it's really hard to, uh, Pick just one. There's so many good ones. But um, so what happens? You've got the power of IBM's Hollerith tabulation technology, and that combines with the the fervent ideology of uh, Hitler and Nazism. You end up with quote a competitive, confusing, and often overlapping network of governmental, private, and pseudo-academic agencies with constantly evolving names, jurisdictions, and sponsors. Uh, so this is, this is what Edwin Black tells us springs up into existence, and they're all directly or indirectly dependent on Hollerith's high-speed technology to sort through the voluminous handwritten or manually typed genealogical records needed to construct definitive family trees. So the technology is used to figure out the definitive family trees of everyone in Germany because they need to find out, are you Jewish? Are you half Jewish? Are you quarter Jewish? Even they're, they're, they get it down to that granularity of detail. Um, and then, quote, challenges to one's Aryan background were commonplace, whether driven by a sense of national duty or ordinary fear, everyone was forced to confront their racial makeup, end quote. 
And this is pretty interesting. I, I, I drew an arrow to this and I wrote unconscious bias training because this is what's being rolled out in corporations nowadays. Um, you're being told to reflect on your uh, racial makeup because some races have more are more prone to uh, to uh, racism and have uh, more racism in their past so we are told that they need to be feel bad about and, and do and feel guilty for and um, and this is this is being rolled out in corporations again nowadays which is kind of alarming um, and then I under, I underline this because uh, back back then um, they, they're they're wondering where they can go with this technology and this data collection. Quote, senior interior ministry officials reviewed one fanciful proposal for a 25 floor circular tower of data to centralize all personal information. The proposal was rejected because it would take years to build and stock, but the futuristic concept opened the eyes of Reich planners. Um, and it goes on to describe how there's 25 floors, 12 circular rooms, 31 cabinets, each for one each for the day of the month. Each cabinet has 7,000 names. Uh, there's going to be 60 million Germans who are organized and cross-indexed in a single location and 1,500 couriers running around trying to get the files and, and retrieve them. Uh, and, and I just put in the margin next to this whole thing, Facebook. <laughs> they because they've done it. They've, they've just built a thing where everyone is just voluntarily giving up all their personal details and private details and private information. And as I said before, let's pray uh, we don't have another Hitler suddenly come to power and in charge of that whole machine. Um, so they developing registries on different groups of people, including the Freemasons, which I thought was quite interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, and then, yeah, then we learn, quote, eugenics became an elite cult. Nazis sought to weed out the weaker elements of its population, regardless of parentage, even from among their own people. The mentally ill, diseased, handicapped, homosexual individuals, certain Jews, gypsies, and group of misfits termed antisocial were not to be part of Germany's future. And then uh, beginning in the summer of 1934, we get organized sterilization. So again, none of this stuff would have been possible if they weren't able to collect massive amounts of data and process it very quickly and efficiently thanks to IBM's Hollerith machines. Um, and the chapter kind of goes on to give more details about uh, what information is gathered on people, including uh, diseases um, and different, you know, their jobs, population engineering, uh, disabilities, uh, whether they have liability insurance, uh, academic testing data from schools. Um, so IBM is loving this because, quote, for IBM, information was money. The more Germany calculated, tabulated, sorted, and analyzed, the greater the demand for machines. So so Germany's getting egged on at this point by Watson. He's he's egging them on. He's he's like, yeah, keep going. And, you know, and, and he's they're selling them more machines and they're selling them more punch cards and they are making an absolute killing. In fact, quote, IBM was making so much profit in Germany, it was causing problems. <laughs> About $1 million profit was suddenly earned by the end of 1933. This at a time when nearly all of German industry was being battered due to the international anti-Nazi boycott. De Homag had sold an unprecedented 237% of its 1933 quota, outpacing all IBM foreign operations combined. Yet Nazi business precepts denounce large corporate profits, especially those earned by foreign corporations. So this is when they uh, they have to start uh, their their money gets locked in bank accounts, and um, there follows all this complicated legal back and forth, toing and froing corporate type um, problems where they need to uh, try and unlock this this money, but. It just keeps building up and building up and building up. They are they are really uh, raking it in, and uh, and so. But Watson, ever the capitalist, quote: If Watson couldn't receive his money, he saw no reason why anyone else should either. As the chief stockholder, Watson voted that no dividends would be paid. I told you he was a bastard. Um. So Watson is basically this whole time. Um, focusing on 
we're a business and we're trying to make profits and we're doing nothing wrong and that's all that matters for us um but as uh, the last sentence of this chapter says quote the dawn of the information age began at the sunset of human decency um i think this is one of the powerful things about this book is it really uh, tells that story of the dawn of the information age the the, the birth of big data and uh, the power of having so much data and what it can be turned towards if wielded by someone with a tiny mustache so chapter five we learn that uh watson is uh he's on the up and up he um is deepening his involvement with the nazis he's uh consolidating his profits and the money he's making and he's getting and he's really cozying in and cozying up to hitler um and this is a chapter that i found pretty fascinating because at the at the end of it uh, we, we learned that quote watson would become a hero in nazi germany both to the common man and to adolf hitler himself um so so watson is is he's really impressing hitler and uh probably not something you should be proud of but in the end hitler decides to give him a medal and this medal is the uh, highest honor that can be given to foreigners by germany um so and don't forget as well you know hitler was named times time man of the year twice i believe it's pretty fascinating that he was on the front cover of time magazine twice if, but uh someone should fact check me on that and go and check it out don't believe me because i might be getting that wrong and then the other thing that happens is watson becomes the president of the icc which is the international chamber of commerce and if you don't know what that is quote the icc was a non-governmental organization created by the league of nations to promote world trade and study the hard mechanics of treaties governing such international commerce as postal shipping currency banking and patent rules watson was elected chairman of the foreign department uh, and then on the next page he is elected president he was now the undisputed paragon of world trade so it's just fascinating and mind-boggling to me that this gentleman is uh charged with antitrust with an antitrust uh case um proven to be accelerating and aiding and abetting the uh hitler's nazi persecution of the jews and he's getting promotion after promotion and he's hobnobbing and rubbing elbows with powerful people he gets a medal from hitler himself which is called the merit cross of the german eagle with star uh, and it actually says here quote the merit cross of the german eagle with star was created to honor foreign nationals who made themselves deserving of the german reich it ranked second in prestige only to hitler's german grand cross um and then uh we got another quote here where uh, watson's telling new york times that there's not going to be a war no country wants war no country can afford it this is all happening prior to world war ii getting into full swing ibm start building bomb shelters prior to war breaking out which is a bit fishy uh but at this point um Hitler and his Nazis are using the Holrith devices to identify Jews and to run them out of where they're living, get them out of the towns and start uh, taking back their businesses and their homes and their assets and things like that. IBM are building bunkers near to their um, factories in, uh, in Germany. Um, so given that watson is telling the new york times there will be no war no country wants war no country can afford it it's pretty interesting that at the same time he's got his men building bomb shelters <laughs> the new york times actually is by far and away edwin black's favorite newspaper to quote uh in this book the footnotes are absolutely 
filled with references to New York Times headlines and stories in the New York Times, which I thought was a bit odd because quite a lot, a lot of the time when he's detailing the horrors of uh, the of World War Two and the the atrocities which were committed by the Nazis, uh, it it tends to be eighty percent of the time he's referring to New York Times articles and headlines and stories that were printed there which i just thought was curious because surely if it was all over the papers there would be many different publications to choose from perhaps he just had very good access to the new york times um but then uh, so we start learning about um all the the rollout of how the nazis begin to find the jews in various countries that they they move into and watson's he's kind of advocating in favor of germany throughout all of this so as the as people are getting angry and starting to question what's going on over there he's like hey don't worry about it they're cool he's 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 sort of advocating uh and saying uh that if we can if we can enable trade that will make everything all right so uh watson argued quote his well-worn Hitler-esque appeal that the world redistribute its raw materials and lower so-called trade barriers as the path to peace. This public lobbying was undertaken even as the mass media regularly published articles and broadcast explanations that Germany desperately only needed those raw materials to arm her war machine. More than that, whenever Watson returned from a tour on the continent, his dockside remarks always spoke glowingly of the optimism throughout Europe and the steadily increased standard of living for all. So he is clearly talking out of his backside saying these kind of things, but it was pretty impressive and brave of him to stand up there and say them anyway, knowing that uh, public opinion was going in a very different direction. I do admire anyone who has the balls to stand up uh, and speak against the popular opinion of the day. I think that's a, certainly a test of character. So we get a bit more context of how uh, the, the, the situation that Watson finds himself in. Quote, Germany is pro put, was portrayed in emotional headlines and feature articles as a savage, murderous nation bent on destroying and dominating all of Europe, no matter how many people died. Um, quote, most Americans would not tolerate anyone who even appeared to be a Nazi sympathizer or collaborator. So, quote, Watson worked to secure the underpinnings of his public image. He intensified his advocacy for peace and against all war. Um, Watson's advocacy for peace was limitless. May 13th, 1940 was proclaimed IBM Day at the World's Fair being held that month in New York. Uh, and if you don't know what the World's Fairs are, they're really worth checking out and looking at. Fascinating piece of history, not very often talked about or explained. Um, IBM Day was nothing less than an extravaganza of orchestrated adulation for the company. A dozen chartered trains brought in 7,000 IBM employees and their wives from company facilities across the nation to visit the architectonic IBM Pavilion. Each IBM wore a red ribbon of solidarity with the company. 2,000 lucky ones were chosen to be fated at a massive Waldorf Astoria dinner. Uh, Watson gave a speech on this day to uh, 30,000 of his guests. I couldn't find a transcript of that, which was a shame. Um, but as the, we learn here, as head of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, that's probably an organization uh, worth looking into. Watson everywhere proclaimed his driving mantra, world peace through world trade. Um, it's pretty impressive that he's looking on the scale of the world and the globe. Uh, he's trying to clearly not uh, ashamed of building his corporation up to that size. And I could see, I could sense that he probably would be happy with IBM systems being global and used in every country for every reason, seeing as he had no qualms about selling them to Hitler and the Nazis. Um, and this also is the, the, uh, the, the IBM day at the World Fair, where I believe his IBM symphony is played. So he, he uh, commissions an orca uh, a composer to write an IBM symphony 
and um, I was extremely happy to find out that the whole thing is on YouTube which so you can search IBM Symphony and give that a listen uh, I sent it to a friend of mine and he said he could he could hear the evil in the music so at this point as well we find out that um, America hasn't yet joined the war yet Watson is just uh, reaping in the profits and expanding in line with the uh, Germans and, ha and they're occupying different areas and, and they're taking his machines and he's ex establishing subsidiaries and providing um, Hollerith machines and tabulating services in these areas. And we learned that, quote, it was never clear exactly how much true profit IBM earned worldwide because of the stealthy way its many subsidiaries classified and reclassified revenues to avoid taxation. IBM profits have been in a steep climb since the day Hitler came to power. Clearly, the war was good to IBM coffers. Um, and I think this is very true of what happens today. Money just gets moved around and shifted around and relabeled and tax loopholes are exploited. And then these people who exploit these tax loopholes and get incredibly rich start to hold uh, a lot of power making a lot of decisions that affect the rest of us. And uh, it doesn't really make much sense because as I mentioned, they're not elected and they're not even paying their taxes into the system to have a right to say how it's run and how things go. So uh, it's something to watch out for today as well. It was happening back then and it's still going on today. But basically to get back to the story, Watson is banking on America not joining in the war. Um, and he is planning for the post-war boom and a complete reorganization of the world's economic system. Um, now, the problem he finds is that as the public mood swelled against all things Nazi, Watson was now confronted with one major public relations problem, his medal. <laughs> so, he, so he then has this uh, conundrum because he's been given this medal and he's on very good terms with... Uh, Hitler and and uh, but public uh, scrutiny and public anger is starting to build up and IBM itself starts coming under scrutiny for its Nazi connections. Uh, you've got FBI, FBI director J. Edgar Hoover getting interested in IBM's uh, Nazi connections, although no charges were ever brought. Um, and then we learn here that uh, as soon as Watson learned of the FBI's interest, even before the agency could organize its investigations, he went into action. Watson visited Under Secretary of State Summer Wells on July the 6th to volunteer personal details about potentially suspect IBM employees in the US and Latin America. <laughs> so, so they've been kind of um, working with people and having them come over to America, uh, particularly Germans, and they decide to get ahead on the FBI's investigation and start pointing the finger at some of their own employees and uh you know oh, i always thought there was something a bit fishy about that guy <laughs> very uh very courageous for watson the father of the ibm family to start throwing his employees under the bus and uh, letting them take the fall for his um for clearly his decisions and unscrupulous business uh choices all right I got to end it there. I am tired. I've only got through about half the book. Um, and I'm coming up on an hour of video now. So this is going to have to be a two-part. This is, I'm going to wrap this up and call this part one. And then I'm going to sit down another night and walk you through the rest of this book. But uh, if you like what you've heard so far, get out there and grab a copy and preserve it. And put it on your shelf. Read it. Make some notes. Tell other people about it. Uh, fascinating part of history that I did not know anything about and that's why I really want to capture it and tell you people about it as well and as always thank you very much for being here with me and uh, spending the time um, I really appreciate anyone who uh, sticks with me and listens to my uh, my efforts uh, I think there are amazing stories to be found in books uh, and not enough of us are reading them and talking about them and telling each other about them. Um, this is one of those that I think everybody should know about. Everybody should know that IBM did what they did um, and their products are still in use today. We're surrounded by IBM's products. In fact, I was just reading that they're building a quantum computer. 
I think they might have released it in 2019 or previewed it or something. So, I mean, it, it, again, just bear in mind the parallels between this story and what went on here and the modern day and what could go on today. Uh, they're still building machines that collect data and process that data. They're getting faster and better and bigger and stronger. And uh, it only takes one nasty little person who's full of spite and spleen hell-bent on eradicating whatever group it happens to be uh, to get into the driving seat um, some might argue that's already happening i have a couple of books uh, on the effects of technology the origins of technology in particular which uh, i'm sure i'll get around to reviewing and talking to you about one day uh, but for now i'm signing off i'm gonna go to bed i'm gonna get some sleep uh, and forward to that very much and please keep an eye out my on my channel Hayes Reviews for part two of IBM and the Holocaust by Edwin Black. Uh, thank you very much. It was an honor and a privilege to tell you this story.